Amen. So we're on the fifth roadblock to your faith. So, so far we have covered worry and anxiety, guilt and shame, greed. Last week was unforgiveness. And today we're going to talk about legalism. So how many of you have heard the word legalism before? Huh? All right. Well, if you've never heard the word legalism, don't worry. I have a big definition for you that's going to come up on the screen in a minute. Um, But legalism is a sin that affects the church. And regardless if you've been in the church and you've been saved for 50 years or you've been saved for 50 days or you're still trying to figure out who Jesus is, it's something um, that we all face. And so I pray today that as we go through this, it'll kind of help point out um, some areas where legalism pops up. I might step on some toes. I definitely stepped on my toes as I was preparing the sermon. So um, hopefully, uh, you know, the Lord will speak through it. But, um, and hopefully you had your coffee, you did some kind of calisthenics or something like that, and that you are prepared to do active listening. All right? Because unlike Steve, my slides are pretty elementary. Like I didn't put up the application points all neat, you know, like I was doing good just to get the scripture up there. So you guys are going to have to listen, take notes. Uh, I know, just bear with me on this. But So here we go. Definition of legalism. Ready? Legalism is an attempt to gain favor with God or to impress our fellow man by doing certain, certain things or avoiding other things without regard to the condition of our hearts before God. At the root of legalism is the sin of pride, because the legalist thinks that he is able to commend himself to God by his own good deeds. Invariably, he is only looking at externals, not at his heart. Also, the the legalist's pride motivates him to exalt himself in the sight of others by his outward behavior, again neglecting to see the corruption of his own heart. Thus, legalism denies human depravity. Human depravity basically means we're all jacked up, that we all sin, right? That, that none of us uh, have everything all together. And, and it exalts human ability. So the legalist would be the one that thinks that he can do everything on his own and, and there's no need for God. And so as such, it is, opposed, it is opposed to the gospel of God's grace. That's why both Jesus and Paul clashed with the legalists. And so I, I ripped this definition off from Stephen J. Cole. He's a pastor somewhere in the United States. Um, and you need to thank Mr. Stephen J. Cole wherever he is because, because of him, uh, I've now whittled down like three or five sermons on legalism down to one because I basically ripped off his outline um, that he had. So, so <laughs> yeah, thanks, Stephen, because, um, you know, I, it was like I wanted to back the dump truck up because I, I read so many good things and it was like I just want to talk about all of them. But um, I had a complete ser- different sermon outline as of Wednesday of this week, and then, and then I ran across this, and I was like, that dude's saying what I'm trying to say. So um, anyways, so I thank uh, Stephen Cole for his efforts here. But go ahead and turn your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Like I said, I put the scriptures up on the screen for you. Um, let me give you a brief background before we get into the scriptures themselves. So Pharisees, right? We're going to be talking about the Pharisees a little bit today because uh, Jesus directly uh, attacked them for being ones that were legalists in the New Testament as well as Paul. There's multiple places in the New Testament that talks about legalism. That's why it's so hard for me to narrow it down to, to one sermon, I would say. But, but the Pharisees were Jewish, uh, a Jewish relig- religious group that zealously followed the Old Testament law. And they did it so well that they even added to it. Right, so we know that God gave Moses the the law on Mount Sinai, right, the Ten Commandments, and then in addition to the Ten Commandments, there was additional commandments given, like 613 total commandments in the Old Testament, and these were given so that the people of Israel would know how to live, how God wanted them to live. It also helped point out the holiness of God, how God was completely separate and different and holy. Uh, than anything else in the world. So they looked funny because they began to follow these commands that, that called them out. Uh, and so, but what happened is, is that over time, uh, the people lost track of what they were doing, began to do the, the, follow the rules and try to do, earn salvation, basically. They forgot about the grace of God, that the only way you're saved is, is through faith. So th- their hearts uh, were not in it. They may have been following the rule, but their, 
Their hearts were not in it. So um, we know that the law was given to us, and it's a good thing, and that Jesus obviously obeyed the law and encouraged us to do so. But whenever we try to uh, follow the law uh, to the extent that we think it can save us or earn favor or merit with God, that's when things fall apart. So that's where we're going today. Hopefully everybody's warmed up, and we'll uh, start in Luke chapter 11, verse 37. And so uh, first thing we'll see is legalists look, uh, like to look clean on the outside but neglect the inside. They like to look clean on the outside but neglect the inside. So when Jesus had finished speaking, now he had been out and had been teaching, and, and he's already clashed with the legalists, right? So he's already kind of stepping on their toes a little bit. Uh, so when he finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. All right, any of your parents in here? Huh? Wait, your kids, you know? Hey, did you wash your hands before you eat? Right? That's something that we expect, right? And, uh, but see, the, the legalists had a little bit more going on here. My kids are like, yeah, I washed them like two days ago, right? So uh, it, it, there's more going on. The legalists actually... Um, added to just a regular hand washing to get the dirt off your hands, they made it into this ceremonial hand washing, right? So now if you want to eat at my house, you wash your hands ceremonially. Uh, that's what the Pharisees did. It was like what the priests were required to do in the Old Testament, but now they, upped it, they kicked it up a notch and said, well, we got to do this fancy washing. So Jesus obviously would have known this, right? He would have known that the Pharisees expected him to do this, and he didn't do it. It'd be like if I go to my father-in-law's house. Some of you guys have met Big Chief. He's come here to church before. Uh, my father-in-law, Big Chief. If I were to go to his house and sit down at the table as we're about to eat with my shirt off and a baseball hat on, right? Because, like, I go to Big Chief's house, and I come in the house with my hat on. They're like, why, why are you doing with your hat on inside the house, boy? You know? And um, he does that to me in my own house. Like, why are you wearing your hat inside the house, you know? So, like, it's, I know it's something that's offensive to Big Chief. So when I go to Big Chief's house, I don't wear my hat inside, right? And, and, but see, Jesus here is starting to poke a little bit. And uh, so then he move, let's move on to verse 39. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees, uh, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Again, there were rituals for how they clean their dishes. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Basically, what Jesus is saying here is that if your insides were clean, if you were right with God, then you would be generous to the poor. But see, these Pharisees apparently were only caring about the outward things, so like this ritual of hand washing. And so... Uh, if they were really had, were right with God and, and uh, cared about God and were seeking after the heart of God, then Jesus, Jesus is basically saying you would give to the poor. You know, that would be one way we would see things play out in your life, right? But, you know, we, we too kind of end up like the Pharisees a little bit, don't we? You know, like uh, somebody comes over and maybe they don't have enough status, like not as much status as you. You're kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to be seen with them in public, or should we let that person in the church? I mean, look at the clothes they're wearing. Those are the wrong clothes. Like, how dare you show up? What? Or did you see what that person did at the club last night? How dare they come in here, right? You know what they did last week? I mean, that's kind of what the Pharisees doing to Jesus, right? Like, really? You're going to come in here and do this? So, they, look, they like to look clean on the outside, but neglected the inside. The second thing we'll see is that the legalists major on the minors and minor on the majors. Now, we're going to get into six woe statements. Woe, woe is basically an, an exclamation of God's judgment on them. So that's what woe means. So here goes Jesus. Woe to you Pharisees, because you, have, you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue, that's not like a gumbo root. That's like a herb root, a strong-smelling herb. So you give God a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former. 
undone. See, this, this was also something that was practiced in the Old Testament, talked about in Leviticus 27. So Jesus is not condemning the fact that they actually tithe a tenth of their spices. I mean, that's really getting down to the minutiae, right? Like, wow, you must really think highly of yourself that you're so good that you've got to tithe a tenth of your spices, right? He's not getting on to them for that, but he's getting on to them for the fact that if they really truly love God, then, then they would be doing other things, right? Mark 7, as, they, as Jesus is attacking the Pharisees, Mark 7 talks about um, your lips, you give me lip service, but your heart is far from me. And it goes on in, in verse 11 and says that, you know, basically you're doing so well giving your tithe that you're telling people that you can't even give money to help support your parents, right? So what do you think is more important, supporting your parents or giving a tenth of your herbs? So the legalists major on the minors, right? They, it would be expected, it's scriptural to help your parents out, right? It's scriptural to, to give to them, the ones that supported you and brought you up in life. And yet these people are saying, ah, oh, we can't give to you because, you know, our money goes to the church. Look how good I am, right? So what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he said to love your neighbor as yourself. See, these Pharisees are losing sight of what is important. They're neglecting people, essentially. And so, you know, we too can fall under this trap, right? We can forget to love God and love others. We can come in here on a Sunday morning, give our money to the church, listen to the sermon, walk past multiple people in need, get in our new car, and we can go to the restaurant drop a hundred bones at the restaurant, feeding our family, and yet fail to take care of the person that, we, that potentially has need, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to do. Or maybe, you know, you're uh, a, fo- a person that struggles with um, wanting to give, but you also want it to be seen when you give, right? That's kind of what these Pharisees are doing. Because the Bible tells us when you give, do it in secret. So the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So that you're building up treasures for yourself in heaven, right? And that's what we should be doing. But oftentimes when we give, it's like, you know, you're putting that check in that basket skin pass. Or, you know, you got that big fat hundred coming out today. <laughs> what? Let me hold this around for a minute. Let everybody see what I'm doing. Right? So Jesus is coming after him a little bit, right? You guys are, you got your value system mixed up. It's about loving me and it's about loving other people. Number three, legalists focus, they focus on self-glory. Woe to you Pharisees because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. You see, uh, Pride is the opposite of humility, as we read in our definition earlier. Pride is the opposite of humility, and pride is the downfall of the legalists because they want to have the best places to sit, right? And they want to be greeted in the best way. But it's the opposite of who Jesus is, right? Jesus came in humility. We see that in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. What does Jesus say? He who is first will be last, and he who is last will be first, right? So pride is at the heart of legalism, and human, humility is at the heart of the gospel. So I've got a confession to make, since we're stepping on everybody's toes today. But um, when Steve asked me to preach, you know, they, were, they had a wedding in Lockhart, he and Jess, uh, yesterday, and they got back late, and they knew this was coming, so... They're like, well, Jake's too busy leading worship, and uh, so I get tapped, right? And it's been a while, and uh, he asked me to preach, and my first thought was, I wonder what people are going to think of me. I wonder if I'm going to do a good job. I wonder if I will gain some kind of recognition. I wonder if my status in the church is going to improve based on my preaching abilities. Isn't that sad? I had to confess that to folks as I was preparing my message because truly that's kind of where my thoughts went. I was like more concerned about what you guys were going to think about me 
than what God was going to think about me and whether or not I was preaching the message that God had for us today. We do it all the time, right? You know, that what's, the, what's that guy's name, Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy? You know, here's your sign. Anybody familiar with that? Here we go. You might be a legalist if you care more about what other people think than what God thinks. Man, how many of us? We are guilty of this every day. Didn't know we were legalists, did we? You might be a legalist if you compare yourself to others and you think you look pretty good. <laughs> At least I'm not like that guy. You might be a legalist if you get mad or jealous when someone else receives recognition. Or you might get upset when someone else does something better than you can do it and feel ripped off. Why can't I do what that person's doing? You see, essentially that's what the Pharisees were doing. They had lost sight of, of what the gospel really was, the heart of the gospel we need to give up the best seat so that others can have it, right? We need to not think too highly of ourselves. We need to be willing to associate with people in positions that are lower than ours. That's what Jesus did. Number four, legalists subtly corrupt others. Legalists subtly corrupt others. So verse 44, woe to you because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us. No joke. So why is the unmarked grave? What does that even mean? Basically, in Numbers uh, chapter 19, if you touched a dead body or a tomb or uh, walked over a grave, you are ceremonially unclean, right? So he is basically saying, you are like an unmarked grave. So you are corrupting people. You are contaminating people. You are making them unclean just because they are in your presence, right? And so legalism contaminates unsuspecting people. One of, one of the, uh, I was here this week on Monday, and the ladies were getting ready for the IF conference. There was five of the leadership in here praying. And um, basically, the, the uh, ladies knew I was preaching, and they said, hey, can we pray for you? And one of the girls came up and, and said, um, you know, as she was praying, she says, God, I pray that as Grant goes through his week this week, um, that you would have people that would speak into his life and, and help him uh, to know what he is to say in the sermon. So, I'm, you know, this week I was in Arkansas for work, you know, and I'm like, okay, who's going to talk to me? Who's going to give me something? I need something, right? Help a brother out. And uh, so I'm driving home last night because I was up here working on this sermon. And on my street is the pastor of the First United Methodist Church, Stephen Bell, walking his dog. And so I roll my window down. And I said, hey, Stephen, what's up, man? Oh, I'm just walking the dog. What's new with you? I said, well, I got to preach tomorrow. And... Um, I'm preaching on legalism. He's like, you know what I learned last week? He's like, you know, I've been preaching for 20 weeks. He's like, do you know that a hypocrite was not a derogatory term in the original, when it originated? He's like, I never knew that. And he goes on to tell me about it. Basically, a hypocrite was, there, the word was around in biblical times, but it doesn't mean what it, meant to, what it means today. It was actually a formal title for an actor or a stage player right? In, in Greek, it's combining two words together. I got to look this up to make sure I don't mess it up, but it's an interpreter from underneath. That's what a hypocrite is in the Greek. What that meant was is that in the Greek, when there was a play, they would wear a mask to show you which role they were playing. So they're an interpreter from underneath, right? So you can see where we get the word hypocrite, because a lot of us Show up here on Sunday morning wearing a lot of masks, right? We, we put this mask on like we, we really love God and we're really trying to pursue him, but in reality, our hearts are far from him. Think about it in the home. Parents, 
you know, oftentimes we're really concerned about our kids following the rules and doing what is right. But how often are we doing that for the, the very purpose of shaping their hearts toward God? It's no wonder the statistics say that when kids leave their home these days that they don't return to the faith. It's because we were telling them to do something, we just weren't really telling them why. We were telling them to do something, but we weren't doing what we were asking them to do. We had the mask on, right? Or like uh, in business, you know, I, I do sales, obviously, and um, so what about a dishonest business owner? People in my company, multiple people that I don't believe are Christians, have told me that if you see a cross or an ichthus, that little fish sign, on somebody's business card or advertising, that they're going to be a crook. Is that sad? But it's been true. They won't pay their bills. They treat their employees poorly. So, hypocrites, legalists, they subtly corrupt others. What about what we do whenever... We uh, try, you know, act as a hypocrite. Anybody ever said, I don't want to go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there? Can we all just acknowledge right now that we're hypocrites and, and solve that argument? We're hypocrites. But you know what? It's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus did for us. And that's the message they need to hear. It's the grace that they have, that we can't do anything to earn salvation is by what he's done for us. It's when we start thinking that we've done something that they look at us like, hmm, nope. All right, I'm, carrying, I'm getting a little long-winded here. So I've got to burn through. I've got a time limit. So number five, legalists add unnecessary burdens on other people. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 1 John 5, 3 says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. If we love God, we're going to keep his commands. If we understand what he's done for us, we are compelled because of the love we've experienced from him, right? And guess what? His commands are not burdensome, it says. We put unnecessary burdens. I remember one time I was in a church, and there was this lady. She had to be over 90, um, sitting kind of up in the front, and this girl walks in with jeans on. And the lady starts chastising the girl because she's wearing jeans to church, a teenager. Now, I'm going to say that the lady might have been, you know, hopefully she didn't have all her mental faculties or something, but I'm not sure that was the case. You know, some days I wonder if we would let Jesus in the church with what he must have looked like back then compared to what we think we look like today. Don't play cards, don't dance, don't listen to secular music, don't drink a beer. I had a friend say to me one time, love God and do what you want. Because if you're loving God, then you will not sin. And you can do what you want because the gospel is freedom. It's not a bunch of rules. Now, if you have a conviction about something, by all means, don't go against your conviction. But don't try to hold other people to it. It may not be their conviction. Six, legalists outwardly honor God but disregard his message. Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did, and they killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Uh, yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. In other words, like your fathers killed the prophets, and now you're trying to honor them by building them tombs. How about you just trust the message of Jesus and trying to make your, instead of trying to make yourself look good? Your fathers denied the message of Jesus and killed them. And seven, legalists confuse the simplicity of the gospel. Woe to you experts in the law because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered. You have hindered those who are entering. And when Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law 
began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something that he might say. See, legalism happens because we misunderstand, don't fully grasp the gospel. We lose sight of, lose track of. Because once you become a Christian, there's no higher tier. And if you think there is, then you're wrong. How did you become a Christian? By faith, through God's grace. How do you stay a Christian? By faith, through God's grace. It's not like you have to keep working to maintain your salvation, right? It's still through grace. But somehow as we go on, you know, we start thinking to ourselves, man, I'm I'm sure I'm doing pretty good, (laughs) you know? We We just lose sight. But the truth is, we're all on a level playing field. The Bible says there is no one righteous, not one. The Bible tells us that none of us would seek God apart for his work in us by the power of his spirit and the work of his son, Jesus Christ. So how can we look down on others? How can we think of ourselves more highly if we understand that we've been given everything? Everything. So, by all means, we should try to follow the commands that God has given to us. The scriptures encourage us to do that. Be holy as I am holy, the scriptures say. But when we're doing that, we should check our hearts to make sure we don't have any blind spots. We should check our hearts and make sure that we are thankful for what Jesus did for us. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves and that he lived a sinless life and took our punishment upon himself so that we can be forgiven. And when we figure this out, guess what? We will be compassionate and we will display humility to those around us. So today we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. What a better way to uh, end the service, you know, as we're talking about legalism. This will give us time to reflect. The scriptures encourage us to reflect as we take this meal. If there's sin in our hearts, if we are astray, if we're uh, clean on the outside but not clean on the inside, now's the time to get right. This is a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross and that he died for our sins. His body was crucified. The bread represents his body. The blood, the cup represents his blood, which was shed for our sins, which atones for our sins. It's the way that we can have a right relationship with God because of faith through what Jesus did on the cross. But it's not just that. It's not just a reflective time. It's also a celebratory time because in the scriptures, Jesus tells us, that I will not eat this meal again until I am with you again someday. He didn't just fix us for now. He's going to come back and make everything right. And so we take this meal together as a group of believers, understanding that we have a hope, and that someday all these rights and the struggles we have with the flesh and the struggles we have with hypocrisy, those are going to go away because of what Jesus did. So... Uh, Let me just pray. God, we thank you for all that you have done. We pray that you will um, just work in our lives. Help us to root out the hypocrisy, God. Help us to truly desire to uh, seek after you with our whole hearts, not just with external things. God, as we take this meal together, I pray, God, that you would uh, bless us and that this would be a special time of remembering what you have done and celebrating what you are going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.